Each legislative session, KHI is hard at work keeping you informed on the latest health policy discussions from across the street in downtown Topeka. Health at the Capitol is a KHI production, a monthly recap with our legislative monitoring team offering you a closer look at policy work happening now in Kansas and coming up. Here's a look at topics from our latest episode. Thanks for joining us for Health at the Capitol. My name is Teresa Freed. I'm the Director of Strategic Communication and Engagement at the Kansas Health Institute. And I'm joined by Linda Shepard. She is our strategy team leader, so also leader of our legislative monitoring division. And we also have a new panelist with us, and it's Shelby. You're also new to the organization, so I'm gonna have you go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you do here at KHI, and then also where you came from. Absolutely. Um, my name is Shelby Rao. I'm an analyst here at KHI. Um, so I work on the market innovations team as well as the population health team. So I work um, with Linda on um, legislative monitoring and then I also do work on the um, FIG TA hub. So those are my two primary projects right now. I came from the Association of uh, State and Territorial Health Officials, um, where I was a senior analyst and worked on community health worker portfolios as well as rural health. Okay, so lots of experience in the health world, of course. Um, legislative session, also, of course, no stranger to that. You worked previously at KDHE as well. Correct, yes. Okay, so um, interesting session we've had so far. So we're gonna start talking a little bit about um, what this part of the session is, what, what a first adjournment means. So Linda, do you wanna kick us off by just telling us a little bit about that? Right, um, so first adjournment occurred on April 5th. Um, so the legislators uh, finished up that day uh, of, of the work that they'd done up to that point and then uh, went on this break and uh, they, we refer to that as first adjournment. And then they are uh, will be returning uh, on Thursday, the, the 25th of April, to do the veto session. So um, having that opportunity to respond to bills that the uh, that the governor addressed uh, during the time that they were gone, and then also to finish up some budget matters as well. Okay, so this has been a very active time, especially for the governor's office. Yes, They've yes. been carefully reviewing those those bills and making decisions about what you know the governor supports and what should be vetoed. So talk us through a little bit about some of those bills that will become law. Yeah, so um, she did have a number of uh, health-related bills that were uh, sent to her after they left on the 5th, and, and you're, as you're as you said, she's been working on those, working through them, signing some, uh, vetoing some, and then uh, at least one health-related bill that she did allow to become law without her signature. So there, she's uh, done a little bit of everything during that period of time. So um, bills that she uh, bills that she did sign, I think you know one of the ones that uh, that uh, people have been very interested in is, as you know, there's a lot of concern about having enough. Um, healthcare workers, so the workforce in Kansas. And so two of the bills that were presented to her um, involved having Kansas get involved in these interstate compacts that allow, uh, in this case, dentists and dental hygienists, as well as some social workers, to be able to um, apply for licensing in the state of Kansas and, you know, through this multi-state process. So that, that certainly does open a little bit of that opportunity for more workers to become licensed in Kansas to participate. Um, also, one of the bills that that I, I think is uh, is gotten a lot of attention as well, and it's sort of in this child welfare. And, and actually, there were a number of bills um, that that touched on child welfare that she has addressed. But there was a um, the bill that was addressed that, that we refer to as the soul uh, the soul bill that was going to provide um, some children in the foster care system who are age sixteen or older to give them a chance to. Um, pick somebody that they had a, a relationship with and did not necessarily be a, a, be a blood relative or a family member, but to um, have that person who is willing to step into their lives at that point and um, maintain a long-term relationship with them to help them work through to go into their adult, their young adulthood. So um, I think the the uh, the young folks uh, in Kansas who worked on putting that bill together uh, are very, very proud uh, of that coming together. There was a um, child welfare summit that was held uh, last week that was uh, hosted by the judiciary here in Kansas. 
And some of those uh, young people were uh, panelists uh, during that summit, a very impressive young group of, of people who uh, worked on that bill and brought that. And so Kansas is the first state to, to pass that kind of a bill uh, to ensure that these young people have somebody who's in their corner for them during this time that they're moving into young adulthood. Right, that's so important. Previously, having worked for DCF, you certainly hear a lot of stories about how children age out of the system and they don't have that support and then fall into some of the, the same scenarios that they came from right. in some instances. So that can be a, a difficult time. So that's um, uh, good news for them that they were able to be successful in their efforts there. So. Along those lines of child welfare, we now have um, a particular office that is independent of the other state agencies and is investigating or really exploring some of the, the uh, concerns that people raise. So can you talk about that new position? Sure. So the, um, the Office for the Child Advocate, um, that originally, that office, uh, as it currently exists, had been created by executive order by Governor Kelly. And so it was, it, it was part of her administration. And there had been these efforts in the legislature to um, make that a whole separate agency all of its own. And so that did happen this year. That bill was signed by her. Uh, and so that office, I, I think, you know, will operate pretty similar maybe to the way that it has been and but I think it, that that uh, there are some some specific authority that it's been given during uh, through that bill that'll allow it to um, do some things that maybe it wasn't able to do before but yeah that was uh, certainly a major accomplishment in the child welfare area and there's more legislation that has become uh, or signed by the governor which is relevant to transparency of, of child investigations so Yes. Um, so the um, one of the things that, that we had mentioned before during some of our meetings was that there were um, there had been these requests anytime that there is a situation that arises where a child um, has uh, had physical abuse, particularly in those unfortunate situations when, it, when it, there's a death that occurs with a child. There were um, a lot of rules and regulations and requirements in place that really made it impossible for DCF and some of the other uh, agencies that do those investigations for those situations to release any of that information publicly. And so there were, there were complaints of there being transparency about, about those. And so there, there were at least two bills this year that were signed by the governor that uh, really opened that up. And so it gives DCF some additional authority to release some of that information much earlier than they typically would in the past. Um, before even the, the full investigation is completed, and also for the Child Death Review Board uh, also to have an opportunity to release some of that additional information that they have not been allowed to do so in the past. So it, those, those are both going to open up some of those, uh, respond to some of those requests for information that have come each time one of those unfortunate situations occurs. It's kind of interesting on the child welfare um, legislation, there tends to be, in some cases, uh, pretty good bipartisan support. So yes. is that what you've seen this session as well? Yeah, certainly, certainly some of the bills that we've seen uh, this year, there, you know, the ones, especially obviously the ones that the governor has uh, has gone ahead and signed, there was this good, strong support. And, and I it, definitely in this child welfare area, there has been great bipartisan support for getting some of these things done. All right. And Shelby, you want to touch on any, any legislation that's in front of the governor? Absolutely. So um, this year, the governor also signed the Uniform Vital Statistics Act, which would expand um, the um, different um, healthcare professionals who could certify causes of death for people who have passed away within the state. So Previously, it could only be physicians who could certify deaths. Now, um, physician's assistants, advanced practice um, registered nurses, and then various types of coroners, district coroners around the state could now certify deaths. This is especially important for rural communities who often see um, delays in certification of death, which can cause um, you know, a lot of struggles for families who are you know, wanting to respectfully move forward with their families, taking care of their family members um, throughout that, that transitional period. So um, it's incredibly important for supporting those families and something that we also saw um, have bipartisan support during the legislative session as well. 
Yeah, that's one of those issues you don't typically think of Absolutely. In, until it becomes very necessary. And I'm sure, you know, people in uh, Kansas rural communities, they face, you know, workforce shortages in a mm-hmm. number of ways that can mm-hmm. impact the timeliness of some of those services. So um, talk about any other maybe maybe uh, legislation that might impact um, our communities in a positive way. So, um, as I mentioned, one of the um, one of the bills that the governor allowed to become law without her signature was this bill that was going through that was um, was going to to put into law some uh, requirements for um, making sure that uh, that when young people are going on certain websites that there that there is verification of age, and so that is one of those um, one of those bills that she. She just let it go and become uh, become law. And obviously, there's been a lot of concern of this. I think certainly at the state level, but even at the federal level, these concerns about um, the websites that children are uh, allowed to get to, uh, and it's not always really clear that those age verification processes work the way I think that people intended or or hoped. So, um, I think it'll be. I think part of the reason why she allowed it to just become law was. It, it's still not clear how that's going to really work, and I and I think she she recognized that you know there may be some uncertainty about how that can actually be implemented, but but it, it's certainly well meaning um, and something worth trying. So when when the governor allows something to become law without officially signing it, is that um, still a form of endorsement? I mean, how how should people interpret? So that? I think typically, I mean, it, uh, she does, you know, it's like she signs things obviously that she feels very positive about and um, and and really supports in a in a real meaningful way. Uh, you know, obviously she vetoes the things that she does not think are right for the state, and that's how she handles it. In those cases where a governor. Um, takes that approach of just letting it become law. It really is a situation where it's like I'm not I'm not really opposed to it, but maybe I'm not really sure exactly how this is going to work, uh, and don't feel strongly enough about it to to be able to actually sign it. So, um, you know, when she gets, uh, you know, they they have ten days from the date that the bill's presented to them, and uh, they can they can let that day come and go, and and it becomes law at that point. Okay, um, so another topic that has received attention is, is controlled substances. So, do you want to talk a little bit about action there? Yeah. So there was a there was a uh, a bill that made a lot a number of changes to the um, to our controlled substances act. Uh, added a lot of bills, removed some things as well that. Um, that again, you know, that typically I think when the changes are made to that, a lot of times that's in response to something that happens at the federal level. So they make changes to their controlled substances act, and then the states try to um, come into compliance with that. And so that happened. They also threw. Um, there's also a little bit of something that got added at the end of that. Um, that talked that is talking about um, things that happened in school districts and and uh, related to health care. So that that was something that was sort of thrown in at the bottom, but, but became part of that bill as well. Okay. Any others that that you want to highlight? Going to the Controlled Substance Act, um, if I recall correctly. Previously, they presented that bill every single year, um, which meant less amendments or or less changes every year. But now they're trying to do that um, less often, which means that there's going to be more More changes changes. on a less um, often basis. So Hmm. that's why we saw a lot of changes this year that perhaps um, legislators weren't as used to seeing. Gotcha. Okay, very good. Well, you know, there's sometimes political tension between the governor's office and the legislature. And so some of that plays out during the veto session. Um, So the governor's office has taken a position on some legislation not favorably. So can you talk about the the vetoed bills? Yeah. So the um, uh, one of the veto bills was there, there were bills that were introduced and were considered by the legislature this year related to abortion. Uh, and again, one of those that I think we've talked about in one of our earlier episodes was the bill that would um, that would require a, a woman to be asked um, to provide the reasons why she's making the decision to have an abortion. And as you can imagine, there there was a lot of um, difference of opinion about whether or not that was a good thing or a bad thing. And so she did veto that bill and. Uh, and uh, again, the, the veto session starts tomorrow. We're, we're, we're recording on the 24th, so right. it starts tomorrow. Um, and that's certainly one of the ones that, that I expect that the legislature might want to um, consider whether they want to override that, because I think there, w- there was some strong support for that. Okay. Other vetoed measures? 
Um, uh, along the same lines, we also saw a um, abortion-related bill that was also vetoed. So um, like the previous bill, this, this bill had strong legislative support. So um, I'm sure that this is going to be one that will be considered in veto session um, pretty heavily as well. Gotcha. Yeah, um, the other the other big bill that I think will be looked at closely is um, the, the bill that was that was introduced. Very very lengthy bill had a lot of provisions in it, um, primarily related to uh, medication and treatment for gender dysphoria. Uh, and so there were a lot of provisions in there that talked about um, certain certain agencies, certain state employees that could not take certain actions related to um, encouraging. Uh, children, this was specifically focused on children, uh, to take those kinds of actions, also uh, put some prohibitions on health care providers and, uh, you know, with a, with an outcome that they could, uh, that that would be viewed as uh, a violation of their, their licensing, uh, potentially put their license in jeopardy, and also created, a, uh, would create a cause of action for those situations. So there, there are just a number of issues related to that, to those treatments that uh, were being prohibited. And, and again, the governor vetoed that one, and that one did get a lot of, uh, a lot of attention and, and a lot of discussion among the legislators. So I expect it could be uh, up for override as well. Okay, and so, you know, the lingering topics that we've talked about through all of our episodes here, I, I touch on Medicaid expansion. We're still hearing discussion of that. Is it a completely dead issue at this point, or is there still an opportunity there in this yes. session? So currently for Medicaid expansion, there's a motion on the floor of the Senate um, that would allow Medicaid expansion um, to be brought to the Senate floor. So um, essentially this motion would um, allow the Senate to consider Medicaid expansion. 24 votes would bring it um, out, of committee. out of committee, and then 27 votes um, would bring it above the line, which would give the senators the opportunity to vote on the bill. Okay, so that's why we're still here in conversation exactly. happening, and so it's not over till it's over, right? Right, that's right. Okay, so walk us through the rest of session. We've got um, veto session, then we've got what left? Yeah, so that that's really pretty pretty much it. So they will return tomorrow. Um, it, it was interesting because they originally, uh, under the original schedule, were not scheduled to come back till Monday. Right. Uh, and then it got moved to Friday, and then it can now it's moved to Thursday. Um, so again, as I mentioned earlier, part of part of the work that they'll be doing is uh, the omnibus omnibus budget bill uh, that is also uh, being worked on. So the both the um, Senate and the House uh, budget committees uh, will be meeting tomorrow as well to sort of work work out those issues, and then uh, so they'll they, they need to finish that up. They will be considering any overrides of any of the vetoes um, that that the governor did, and then uh, Shelby and I were just talking. You know, they they everything we're hearing is that they'll be out of here by the end of the day on Tuesday, the 30th. Um, and then after that, I mean, it, it, it's really over at that point. And so uh, we won't, um, you know, there, there wouldn't be any any additional activity after that. And uh, as far as KHI is concerned, we'll, we'll start putting together then our, our final recap issue brief that takes the look at, at the whole session and everything that was considered um, or finalized in this case related to health. So we'll have a lot to talk about in the recap. Yes, we will. And of course, you know, we will have this episode, but then also our blog series, which is Health at the Capitol. And you can get more information about the topics that we discussed here today on our website at khi.org. Please subscribe to our emails. You can do that also on our website. That way you get the latest information from the Kansas legislature. Thanks for joining us.